Good morning. Um, we've heard uh, three outstanding speakers earlier today uh, who have elucidated the history and the status of the Rohingya. Uh, the aim of the current talk that we're about to hear uh, is to supplement the work of the speakers who have already presented today and of those who will present later on today by providing health statistics that my colleagues and I in Boston have com compiled through a summation of existing data. Um, as you know, health data on the Rohingya is limited due to barriers to data collection and documentation imposed by the government. Our goal is to empower a global physician audience to understand the healthcare crisis facing the Rohingya so that they too may participate in the care of this community as my colleagues and I have done. So I invite your comments and corrections. For the sake of consistency, I'm going to use certain contemporary geographical terms um, and um, I apologize if that offends anyone, but it's only because of consistency. So in November 2014, the United Nations launched a global campaign to end statelessness within 10 years. This effort will require resolution of the Rohingya crisis because the Rohingya account for one in seven of such stateless persons worldwide. Also in 2014, Myanmar can completed its first population census in three decades. This census excluded Rohingya population, explaining that in Rakhine state, members of some communities were not counted because they were not allowed to self-identify as Rohingya. However, this UN-backed census did estimate a non-enumerated population in Rakhine state of 1.09 million individuals based on new village maps. This non-enumerated population also did not take into account 140,000 Rohingya, internally displaced Rohingya living in camps after fleeing the 2012-2013 violence. So by our estimates, there are about 1.2 million Rohingya residing within Myanmar. This makes them 33%, or one in three of the Rakhine population, Rakhine state population, or 2% of the national population of Myanmar. As has been discussed today, uh, these 1.2 million Rohingya face persecution in Myanmar and also in Bangladesh, where they live in precarious conditions and have the threat of refoulement. Consequently, Rohingya are now fleeing from the Myanmar-Bangladesh border, and these Rohingya are relying on human traffickers to undergo dangerous, weeks-long maritime crossings to seek shelter in Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. Between January of 2012 and April of 2015, for which data is available um, at the present, 160,000 Rohingya have fled by sea. That is an astronomical number. These so-called irregular maritime crossings occur in small, poorly constructed boats under treacherous conditions. And what is most concerning is that the trend is of increasing number of voyages in each trimester over the last three years. So um, on the y-axis here is the number of uh, individuals undertaking so-called irregular maritime crossings. The x-axis divides up the United Nations data into trimesters or three-month periods. So if we compare the trimester, each trimester from 2012, which is in blue, with 2013, which is in white, we see a two-fold increase in these maritime crossings. This upward trend continues in 2014, which is the purple bars, with a notable increase toward the end of 2014, which is right over here where the number really jumps up. And finally, by the first trimester of 2015, the red bars, for which the latest data is available, uh, the number of maritime crossings further doubled compared to the same trimester in the previous year, 2014. So put this in another way, between 2012 and 2015, there has been a 400% increase in the number of irregular maritime crossings. In fact, as you may recall, in 2015, up to 8,000 Rohingya were stranded in drifting boats due to authorities in Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia refusing them access. Overall, between 2014 and March 2015, at least 1,100 have died during these maritime crossings, according to the United Nations. And these deaths are from starvation and dehydration during these crossings, beatings by crew members of the boats, sinking of entire boats, and this equals on average to about two deaths of Rohingya men, women, or children every day during these crossings. 
the UN estimates that the hundreds more will die, have died in border, in border camps uh, held by smugglers across Southeast Asia. Most of these individuals uh, have in part been subject to being sold for slavery by the human traffickers if their, fa if their families back home were not able to cough up $1,200 to $1,800 in ransom, which was not expected at the time of departure. In addition to sex trafficking and forced begging, Rohingya are also sold off to the Thai fishing sector. To understand the plight of the Rohingya, we also have to appreciate the poverty of Myanmar and of Rakhine State. Myanmar is the least developed nation with a per capita gross domestic product of only $250. Rakhine State is one of the poorest within Myanmar, having long suffered from neglect and underdevelopment. So nearly half of Rakhine residents live in poverty compared to one quarter nationally. So we're talking about a, a at-risk population in an extremely poor nation. I'm sorry, in an extremely poor state. Um, in Rohingya predominant northern Rakhine. So a lot of the data that I'm going to now present on healthcare statistics is going to be from the northern part of Rakhine state, which is Rohingya predominant. Um, there's one physician per 140,000 Rohingya. So this is basically that there is no physician. Um, and, humanity, and this contrasts with the non-Rohingya predominant Rakhine state where there is one physician per 680 physicians. So this is indeed a man-made differentiation. Humanitarian agencies such as Medicines Sans Frontiers have been the main providers of, of limited primary care to the Rohingya in Myanmar. The 2012-2013 violence further limited availability of food and healthcare and education. And since then, humanitarian agencies have faced further barriers to accessing Rohingya in IDP detention camps or Rohingya villages which are surrounded by hostile neighbors to which these aid agencies are not able to access. Um, and in March 2014, humanitarian agencies had to limit their, acts, limit their operations in Rakhine state because of uh, Buddhist monks who accused them of preferential treatment towards the Rohingya. It was only nine months later that in 2015 that uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers was allowed to return to um, Rakhine State and they documented an increased mortality rate. So Myanmar, Rohingya and Myanmar therefore face a cycle of vulnerability to health outcomes. This starts with low birth weight due to malnutrition in the mother and the absence of maternal fetal care. Once born, Rohingya children in Myanmar face stunting and wasting. Throughout their life, due to lack of adequate sanitation, they suffer from diarrheal illnesses and other infections. And finally, Rohingya of reproductive age face barriers. Oh, would you like me to stop? No. Oh. I may need more than that. Can I do five more? I don't know. Be organized. Yeah, OK. And finally, Rohingya of reproductive age face barriers to marriage and reproduction. So I have about eight more slides. Sorry. So um, the under five mortality rate, so Rohingya children and infants in Myanmar face severe obstacles to health and nutrition. So we're going to actually go through the cycle, the circle that I just showed you and delineate what exactly happens. So under five mortality in Rohingya predominant areas of Rakhine state is between 135 to 225 deaths per 1,000 live births. This contrasts with 77 per 1,000 deaths in non-Rohingya predominant Rakhine state. Again, this is a man-made differentiation. The average um, under five mortality in a, in a less developed nation is 77. So the rest of Rakhine state is at the global average. It's the Rohingya who are not. And so the under five mortality rate for the Rohingya is twofold to threefold higher than the rest of Rakhine state. Already born with low birth weight and a cycle of poor nourishment continues throughout the life of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Wasting or low birth weight for height is, um, is caused by acute malnutrition and is a strong predictor of under five mortality, which I just showed you. So in Rohingya predominant northern Rakhine state, acute malnutrition is 26%, one in four children. Okay? And to put this into context, the World Health Organization considers the 15% childhood malnutrition rate as a criteria for considering the entire population critical and in need of global food aid. Um, and again, to contrast this with uh, uh, non-Rohingya predominant Rakhine, the rest of the Rohingya non-predominant Rakhine state, 
the, rage, uh, the rate of acute malnutrition is high, but at 14%. Um, so poor nutrition predisposes to Rohingya children to waterborne illnesses and other infectious diseases. And this is best illustrated for physicians by the ratio of individuals who have access to latrines, so latrines to individuals. So nearly half of households in Rohingya predominant Rakhine state lack access to sanitation facilities. And post 2012, 2013, these IDP, internally displaced person containment camps, uh, average one latrine for nearly 40 individuals. And so this is nearly twofold higher than the upper limit recommended by the global minimum standards in humanitarian response. We are on 11 minutes, so please wrap up. Okay. And as a result, due to a paucity of latrines, diarrheas illnesses impact 40% of Rohingya children under the age of five, and Rohingya children therefore have a five-fold greater rate of diarrheal illnesses in Rakhine state compared to the rest of the state. Rohingya and Myanmar face barriers to uh, reproduction. So, as you know, Rohingya couples have to obtain a license for marriage that can take two years, it requires a check of citizenship and almost a $100 fine. And so not surprisingly, the uh, maternal mortality ratio is much higher, as we had mentioned, of uh, 380 for 1,000. Um, so, uh, when, the U, um, when the UN visited these Rohingya camps in 2012, they noted deaths in camps owing to a lack of access to medical assistance, including pregnancy-related complications. And then, in the last two slides, um, Rohingya reproductive rights are further violated by, this, by a two-child policy, which has been further implemented. Uh, this, in, this involves um, Rohingya women confirming birth status in front of Myanmar soldiers by breastfeeding. Um, and these women are required to maintain a 36-month, three-year gap between pregnancies. And so what has been found is that one in seven Rohingya women has had an abortion in the last, um, has undergone at least one abortion, but 25% of them have gone more than one abortion. And um, most of these are, con in fact, all of these are by unqualified medical personnel. And so in conclusion, uh, during the year of 2016, this year, a further 1,000 Rohingya will die during their crossings of Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea to flee the sort of persecution that we have dis discussed. Given the political climate in Myanmar, it's unlikely that this flow is going to abate, and there's an urgent need to allow humanitarian aid agencies and journalists full access to these detention camps. Thank you. Thank you.